I want to introduce you a man that I've known for a very long time, a man that I can say that I love, and a man that I know who will die for you, Brother Malcolm X. Brothers and sisters and friends, and I see some enemies. In fact, I, I, I think we would be fooling ourselves if we had an audience this large and didn't realize that there were some enemies present. Tonight, this afternoon, today, we want to talk about the ballot or the bullet. The ballot or the bullet explains itself. But before we get into it, I would first like to clarify some things that refer to me personally. I am still a Muslim. That is, my religion is still Islam. I still credit Mr. Muhammad for what I know and what I am. He's the one who opened my eyes. At present, I am the minister of the newly founded Muslim Mosque Incorporated, which has its offices in the Teresa Hotel, right in the heart of Harlem. That's the Black Belt of New York City. And when we realize that, that Adam Clayton Powell is a Christian minister, he has Abyssinian Baptist Church. But at the same time, he's become more famous for his political struggling. And Dr. King, from Atlanta, Georgia, or in Atlanta, Georgia, is a Christian minister. But at the same time, he's become more famous for a civil rights struggle. Well, just as they are Christian ministers, I'm a Muslim minister. And I don't believe today in fighting on any one front, but on all In fact, I'm a black nationalist freedom fighter. Islam is my religion, but I believe that my religion is my personal business. It governs my personal life, my personal morals. It's personal between me and the God in whom I believe, just as the religious philosophy of these others is personal between them and the God in whom they believe. But it's best this way. Now, were we to come out here discussing religion, we'd be in an argument. And the best way to keep away from arguments and differences is, as I said earlier, put your religion at home, in the closet. Keep it between you and your God. So, today, though, Islam is my religious philosophy, my political, economic, and social philosophy is black nationalism. Now, the political philosophy of black nationalism only means that the black man should control the politics and the politicians in his community. The time, the time when white people can come into our community and get us to vote for them so that they can become our uh, elected officials and tell us what to do and what not to do, those days are gone. They're over. By the same token, the time when that same white man sends in another Negro to get you and me to support him so that he can use him to lead us astray, those days are gone too. We must, we must understand the politics of our community. And we must know what politics is supposed to produce. We must know what part politics plays in our lives. And as long as we remain politically immature, we will always 
be misled, led astray, deceived, or maneuvered into supporting someone else politically who doesn't have the good of the community at heart. That's right. Open our eyes up, Malcolm. Open our eyes. The political philosophy of black nationalism only means that if you and I are going to live in the black community, and that's where we're going to live, because as soon as you move out of the black community, it's mixed for a period of time. But then they're gone, and you're right there all by yourself again. The economic philosophy of black nationalism only means that we should own and operate and control the economy of our community. Now you, you can't open up a black store in a white community. The white man won't even patronize you. And he's not wrong. He got sense enough to look out for himself. It's you. It's you who don't have sense enough to look out for yourself. The white man, the white man is too intelligent to let someone else come in and gain control of the economy of his community. But you will let anyone come in and control the economy of your community. Control the housing. Control the education. Control the jobs. Control the businesses under the pretext that you want to integrate. No, you're out of your mind. <laughs> the economic philosophy of black nationalism only means that we must become involved in a program of re-education to educate our people into the importance of knowing that when you spend your money out of the community in which you live, the community in which you spend your dollar makes it richer and richer. The community out of which you take your money becomes poorer and poorer. And then, what happens? The community in which you live becomes a slum, becomes a ghetto. The conditions become run down. And then you have the audacity to complain about poor housing in a run-down community while you run it down yourselves when you take your dollar out. And you and I are in a double trap because not only do we lose by taking our money someplace else and spending it, we're trapped because we haven't had sense enough to set up stores and control the businesses of our community. The man who's controlling the stores in our community is a man who doesn't look like we do. But he's a man who doesn't even live in the community. So even when we try and spend our money on the block where we live, or the area where we live, we're spending it with a man who, when the sun goes down, takes that basket full of money into another part of the town. So we're trapped, trapped, double trapped, triple trapped. Any way we go, we find that we are trapped. And every kind of solution that someone comes up with is just another trap. But the political and the economic philosophy of black nationalism shows our people the importance of setting up these little stores and developing them and expanding them into larger operations. Now, Woolworth, it didn't start out big like it is. They, they just started out with a dime store. And then they expanded and expanded and expanded until today they're all over the country and all over the world getting some of everybody's money. And this is what you and I need to get with the General Motors the same way. It didn't start out like it is. It was just a little rat race type operation. And it expanded and expanded until it is where it is right now. And you and I, we have to make a start. And the best place to make a start is right in the community where you live. And once you can create some employment in the community where you live, it will eliminate the necessity for you and me having to act ignorantly, disgracefully, boycotting and picketing some cracker someplace else trying to beg him for a job. Anytime you have to rely upon your enemy for a job, you're in bad shape. Well, he is your enemy. You wouldn't be in this country if some enemy hadn't kidnapped you and brought you here. On the other hand, uh, some of you think you came here on the Mayflower. <laughs> so as you can see, brothers and sisters, today, this evening, it is not 
it is not our intention to discuss religion. If we bring up religion, we'll be in an argument. And the best way to keep away from arguments is, as I said earlier, just keep it at home in the closet. Keep it between you and your God. Because if it hasn't done any more for you than it has, you need to forget it anyway. <laughs> now, whether you're a Christian or a Muslim or a nationalist, we all got the same problem. They don't hang you because you're a Baptist. They hang you because you're black. They don't attack me because I'm a Muslim. They attack me because I'm black. They attack all of us for the same reason. We're all in the same bag, in the same boat. We suffer political oppression, economic exploitation, and social degradation, all from the same enemy. This government has failed us. You can't deny that. Anytime you're walking around here in the 20th century singing, we shall overcome, the government has failed you. This is part of what's wrong with you. You do too much singing. This is, tonight, it's time to stop singing and start swinging. Now, Cassius Clay can sing, but singing isn't what made him the heavyweight champion of the world. Swinging is what made him heavyweight champion of the world. So this government has failed us. The government itself and the white liberals who have been posing as our friends have failed us. And once we see that all the sources to which we have turned have failed, we stop turning to them and we turn to ourselves. We need a self-help program, a, a, a do-it-yourself philosophy, a do-it-right-now philosophy. It's, a, it's an already-too-late philosophy. Yeah. Right. This is what you and I need to get with. And the only time we're going to get a self-help program started is with a self-help philosophy. Black nationalism is a self-help philosophy. And what's so good about it is that you can stay right in the church where you are and still take black nationalism as your philosophy. You can remain in any kind of civic organization and still take black nationalism as your philosophy. You can be an atheist and still take black nationalism as your philosophy. This is a philosophy that eliminates the necessity for division and argument. Because if you're black, well, you should be thinking black. And if you're black and you're not thinking black at this late date, well, I'm sorry for you. Now, once you change uh, your philosophy, it changes your thought pattern. Once you change your thought pattern, it changes your attitude. Once you change your attitude, it changes your behavior pattern. And then you go on into some action. Yeah. But as long as you've got a sit-down philosophy, you'll be in some kind of a sit-down thought pattern. And as long as you're thinking of the sit-down thought, well, they'll have you sitting in everywhere. Yeah. You know, it's not so good to refer to what you're going to do as a sit-in. That right there castrates you. That right there brings you down. What goes with it? Think of it. Think of the image of a someone sitting. An old woman can sit. An old man can sit. A chump can sit. A coward can sit. Anything can sit. Well, you and I have been sitting long enough, and it's time for us today to start doing some standing and some fighting yes. to back that up. Yes. When we look at other parts of this earth upon which we live, we see that black, brown, red, and yellow people are getting their independence. They're not getting it by singing, we shall overcome. No, they're getting it through nationalism. Every nation in Asia gained its independence through the philosophy of nationalism, and, and every nation on the African continent that has gotten its independence brought it about through the philosophy of nationalism, and it will take black nationalism. 
to bring about the freedom of 22 million Afro-Americans here in this country where we have suffered colonialism for the past 400 years. America is just as much a colonial power as England ever was. America is just as much a colonial power as France ever was. In fact, America is more so a colonial power than they because she's a hypocritical colonial power behind it. What is, what do you call uh, second class citizenship? Why, that's colonization. Second class citizenship is nothing but 20th century slavery. How are you going to tell me that you're a second class citizen? They don't have second class citizenship on any other government on this earth. They just have slaves and people who are free. Right. Right. <laughs> well, this government tries to make you think they set you free by calling you a second class citizen. Yeah, okay. You ain't nothing but a 20th century slave. Yeah. <laughs> just as it took nationalism to move, to remove colonialism, from Asia and Africa, it will take black nationalism to remove colonialism from the backs and the minds of 22 million Afro-Americans here in this country. Looks like it might be the year of the ballot or the bullet. That's right. Why? Why does it look like it might be the year of the ballot or the bullet? Because Negroes have listened to the trickery and the lies and the false promises of the white man now for too long, and they've become fed up. They've become disenchanted. They've become disillusioned, dissatisfied. And all of this has built up frustrations in America that make black America more explosive than all the atomic bombs the Russians could ever invent. Whenever you got a racial powder keg sitting in your lap, you're in more trouble than if you had an atomic powder keg sitting in your lap. When a racial powder keg goes off, it doesn't care who. It knocks out the way. Understand this. Danger. Because what can the white man use now to fool us? After he put down that march on Washington, <laughs> you see all through that now, he tricked you. Had you marching down to Washington, yes, had you marching back and forth between the feet of a dead man named Lincoln and another dead man named George Washington singing We Shall Overcome. That's right. That's he made a jump out of you. He made a fool out of you. Made you think you was going somewhere and you ended up going nowhere but between Lincoln and Washington. So this government has failed us. The government itself, and in our frustration, we want action. You'll see this new, young, black man asking for the ballot or the bullet. That old Uncle Tom action is, is outdated. <laughs> the young generation, they don't want to hear anything about the odds are against us. What do we care about odds? Now, when this country was first being founded, there were 13 colonies. The whites were colonized. They were fed up with this taxation without representation. Right? So some of them just stood up and said, liberty or death. Now, I, I, I went to a white school over here in Mason, Michigan. And the white man made the mistake of letting me read his history book. Teaching me that Patrick Henry was a patriot. And George Washington, <laughs> there wasn't nothing nonviolent about old Pat or George Washington. Liberty or death is what brought about the freedom of whites in this country from the English. They didn't care about the odds. Why, they faced the wrath of the entire British Empire. And in those days, they used to say that the British Empire was so vast and so powerful that when the sun would set, they would never sit on it. Because that's how big it was. Yet these 13 little, squatty states Tired of taxation without representation. Tired of being exploited and oppressed and degraded. Told that big British empire, liberty or death. And here you have 22 million 
Afro-Americans, black people today catching more hell than Patrick Henry ever saw. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm here to tell you, in case you don't know it, that you got a new, you got a new generation who don't care anything whatsoever about odds. They don't want to hear you old Uncle Tom handkerchief heads talking about uh, <laughs> the odds. I mean, this is a new generation. Now, if they're going to draft these young black men and send them over to uh, South Vietnam and Korea to face 800 million Chinese, say, if you're not afraid of those odds, you shouldn't be afraid of these odds. Why does this room to be such an explosive political year? Because this is the year of politics. This is the year when all the white politicians are going to come into the black community. You can't find them until election time. You never see them until election time. They're going to come in with false promises. And as they come in with these false promises, they're going to feed our frustration. And this will only serve to make matters worse. I'm no politician. I'm not even a student of politics. I'm not a Republican, nor a Democrat, nor an American got sense enough to know it. I'm, I'm one of the 22 million black victims of the Republicans. One of the 22 million black victims of the Democrats. And one of the 22 million black victims of Americanism. And when I speak, I don't speak as a Republican. No Democrat, no American, I speak as a victim of America's so-called democracy. You and I have never seen democracy. All we've seen is disguised hypocrisy. When we look around America today, we see America not through the eyes of someone who has enjoyed the fruit of Americanism. We see through the eyes of someone who has been the victim of America. We haven't seen any American dream. We've experienced only the American nightmare. And the generation that's coming up now can see it. And they're not afraid to say it. If you go to jail, so what? If you're black, you was born in jail. If you're black, you was born in jail. In the north as well as the south. Stop talking about the south. As long as you south of the Canadian border, you south. <laughs> don't, don't call Governor Wallace a Dixie governor. Romney is a Dixie governor. Now there are 22 million Afro-Americans who are gaining a new political consciousness, becoming politically mature. And as they become, develop this political maturity, they're able to see that the uh, recent trends in these political elections, they see that the race is so close that every time the whites vote, that it's so close they got to go back and count the votes all over again. Which means that any group, any block, any minority that sticks together is in a strategic position. Anywhere you go, that's who gets you. You're in a position to determine who will go to the White House and who will stay in the doghouse. You're the one who has that power. You're the one who sent Johnson. You can keep him in Washington, D.C. or send him back to his Texas cotton pad. You're the one who sent Kennedy to Washington. You're the one who put the present Democratic administration in Washington, D.C. The whites were evenly divided. It was the, the fact that you threw 80% of your vote behind the Democrats to put the Democrats in the White House. When you see this, you can see that the Negro vote is the key factor. And despite the fact that you are in a position to be the determining factor, what do you get out of it? Now, the Democrats have been in Washington, D.C., only because of the Negro vote. They've been down there four years, and all the legislation they wanted to bring up, they brought it up and got it out the way, and now they bring up you. And now they bring up you. You put them first, and they put you last. Because you're a chump. A political chump. In Washington, D.C., uh, in the House of Representatives, there are 257 who are Democrats. Only 167 are Republicans. In the Senate, 
67 are Democrats, only 33 are Republicans. The party that you back controls two-thirds of the House of Representatives and the Senate, and still they can't keep their promise to you because you're a chump. Any time you throw your weight behind the political party that controls two-thirds of the government and that party can't keep the promise that it made to you during election time and you were dumb enough to walk around continuing to identify yourself with that party, you're not only a chump, but you're a traitor to your race. And what kind of alibi do they come up with? Oh, they try to pass the buck to the Dixie Club. Now, back during the days when you were blind, deaf, and dumb, ignorant, politically immature, well, naturally, you went along with them. But today, as your eyes come open and you're able to think and see for yourself, you can see that a Democrat is nothing but a Dixiecrat in disguise. You look at the structure of the government that controls this country. It's controlled by uh, 16 senatorial committees and 20 congressional committees. Of the 16 senatorial committees that control the government, 10 are in the hands of Southern segregationists. Of the 20 congressional committees, 12 of them are in the hands of a Southern segregationist. And they're going to tell you and me that the South lost the war. <laughs> you today are in the hands of a government of segregationists, racists, white supremacists, who belong to the Democratic Party but disguise themselves as Dixiecrats. A Dixiecrat is nothing but a Democrat. Whoever runs the Democratic Party is also the father of Dixiecrats and the father of all of them sitting in the White House. I'll say, and I'll say it again, you got a president from the state of Texas while they'll lynch you in Texas just as quick as they'll lynch you in Mississippi. <laughs> Only in Texas they lynch you with a Texas accent. In Mississippi, they lynch you with a Mississippi accent. And the first thing the cracker does when he comes to power, he invites all the uh, Negro leaders over for coffee to show that he's all right. And these Uncle Toms can't pass up the coffee. Now they come away from the coffee table telling you and me that this man is all right because he's from the South. And since he's from the South, he can deal with the South. Well, look at the logic that they're using. What about Eastland? He's from the South. Make him the president. If Johnson is a good man because he's from Texas, and being from Texas will enable him to deal with the South, Eastland can deal with the South better than Johnson. No, I say you've been misled. I say you've been had. I say you've been took. You know how it goes. One of them come to you, make believe he's for you. And he's in cahoots with the other one who's not for you. Why? Because neither one of them is for you. But they got to make you go with one of them or the other. So this is a con game. And this is what they've been doing to you and me all these years. First thing that Johnson did when he got off the plane and when he became president. You know what he asked? Where's Dickie? <laughs> Do you know who Dickie is? Why, Dickie is old... Southern crack and Richard Russell. Look at here. Lyndon B. Johnson's best friend is the one who is heading the, the forces that are filibustering civil rights legislation. You tell me how in the hell can he be Johnson's best friend? How can Johnson be his friend and your friend too? Now nah, that man is too tricky, especially if his friend is still old Dickie. <laughs> Whenever, whenever the uh, Negroes keep the uh, Democrats in power, they're keeping the Dixiecrats in power. This is true. A vote for a Democrat is a vote for a Dixiecrat. Now, I know that you don't like my saying this, but I'm not the kind of person to come here to say what you like. I'm going to tell you the truth whether you like it or not. Now, up in the North, they got the same thing. The Democratic Party up there don't do it, doesn't do it. They don't do it that way. They got a thing they call gerrymandering. They maneuver you out of power. So even though you're voting, they fix it so you're voting for nobody. <laughs> they got you going and coming. In the South, they outright political wolves. In the North, political foxes. Now a fox and a wolf are both canines. 
Both belong to the dog family. Now, you take your choice. You're going to choose a northern dog or a southern dog. Because either dog you choose, I guarantee you, you'll still be in the doghouse. This is why I say, it's the ballot or the bullet. It's liberty or it's death. It's freedom for everybody or it's freedom for nobody. America today finds herself in a unique situation. Historically, revolutions are bloody. Oh, yes, they are. You haven't never had a bloodless revolution or a non-violent revolution. Why, that don't happen even in Hollywood. <laughs> you don't have a revolution in which you love your enemy. And you don't have a revolution in which you are begging the system of exploitation to integrate you into it. Revolutions overturn systems. Revolutions destroy systems. A revolution is bloody. But America is in a unique position. She's the only country in history actually in a position to become involved in a bloodless revolution. Chinese revolution was bloody. Russian revolution was bloody. Cuban revolution was bloody. French revolution was bloody. And there was nothing more bloody than the American Revolution. But today, this country can become involved in a revolution that won't take bloodshed. All she's got to do is give the black man in this country everything that's due him. Everything. I hope that the white man can see this. Because if you don't see it, you're finished. If you don't see it, you're going to become involved in some action in which you don't have a chance. We don't care anything whatsoever about your atomic bombs. They're useless because other countries have atomic bombs. When two and three different countries have atomic bombs, nobody can use them. So it means that the white man today is without a weapon. He got to come on down to earth. And there are more black people on earth than there are white people on earth. I only have a couple of more minutes. The white man can never win another war on the ground. His days of war victory, his days of background victory are over. Can I prove it? Yes. Take all of the uh, action that's going on in this earth right now that he's involved in and tell me where he's winning. Nowhere. Why, some rice farmers, some rice farmers, some rice eaters, Ran him out of Korea. Yes, they ran him out of Korea. With nothing but some gym shoes, a rifle, and a bowl of rice. <laughs> Took on him and that napalm and all that other actions he's supposed to have and ran him across the Yalu. Why? Because the day that he can win on the ground is past. Oh. Now up in uh, French Indochina, those little peasants, rice growers, took on the might of the French army and ran all the fresh, you remember DM being fool? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rice growers. The same thing happened in Algeria, in Africa. They didn't have anything but a rifle. But they put some guerrilla action on them. French had all these highly mechanized instruments of warfare. But they put that guerrilla action on them and a white man can't fight a guerrilla warfare. Guerrilla action takes heart, it takes nerve, and he doesn't have that. He's brave when he's got tanks. He's brave when he's got planes. He's brave when he's got bombs. He's brave when he's got a whole lot of company along with him. But you take that little man from Africa and Asia and just turn him loose in the woods with a blade. With a blade. That's all he needs. All he needs is a blade, and when the sun comes down, goes down, and it's dark, he's even Stephen. 
So it's the ballot or the bullet. Now today our people can see that we are faced with a government conspiracy. This government has failed us. And uh, don't blame it on the uh, southern senators. This is a government filibuster. This is not a segregationist filibuster. This is a government filibuster. Any kind of activity that takes place on the floor of the Congress or the Senate, that's the government that's responsible. Any uh, kind of dilly-dallying, that's the government that's responsible. Any kind of pussyfooting, that's the government that's responsible. Any kind of act. It is designed to delay or deprive you and me right now of gaining full rights. That's the government that's responsible. And any time you find the government involved in a conspiracy to violate the citizenship or the civil rights of the people, then you are wasting your time going to that government expecting redress. Instead, you have to take that government to the world court and accuse it of genocide and all of the other crimes it is guilty of today. When the government of uh, South Africa began to trample upon the human rights of the people of South Africa, they were taken to the UN. When the government of Portugal began to trample upon the rights of our brothers and sisters in Angola, they were taken before the UN. Well, even the white man took the Hungarian question to the UN and, and just this week, Chief Justice Goldberg was crying over the rights of three million Jews charging uh, Russia with violating the UN Charter because of its mistreatment of the human rights of Jews in Russia. Now you tell me, how can the plight of everybody on this earth reach the hall of the United Nations and here you have 22 million Afro-Americans, black people today, you tell me why the struggle has never been taken to the UN. So those of us who have gone and decided to make our political and economic and social philosophy called black nationalism, we have involved ourselves into the civil rights struggle. We have injected ourselves into the civil rights struggle and we intend to expand it from the level of civil rights to the level of human rights. As long as you fight it, on the level of civil rights, you're under Uncle Sam's jurisdiction. You're going to his court expecting him to correct the problem. He created the problem. He's the criminal. You don't take your case to the criminal. You take your criminal to court. So, those of us have decided to get into political economic philosophy of black nationalism. And we intend to expand it. And once we do, you will see that we are not playing around anymore. This is a new generation. When the, uh, when the nation of uh, South Africa, the current situation that it's in right now, Uncle Sam, here he is, coming up to us with his hand, with the blood of your and mine, mothers and fathers, right there on his hand. And he, yet he stands up as a leader of the free world. Here he is, standing up with the blood, just dripping down his jaws like a bloody jawed wolf. And still this man has got the nerve to point his finger at South Africa or point his finger at Nazi Germany or point his finger at Portugal. No, no more days like this. So I'll say in my conclusion that the only way we're going to solve it is that we've got to unite. We've got to work together in unity and harmony and black nationalism is the key. And how are we going to overcome the tendency to be at each other's throats and the, and the reason in our, in our neighborhoods, and, and, and the reason that this tendency exists is that the strategy, the strategy of the white man has always been divide and conquer. He keeps us divided in order to conquer us. He'll tell you I'm for separation and you're for integration. Keep us fighting with each other. No, I am not for separation and you're not for integration. For you and I for is freedom. Only you think integration gets you freedom, I think separation will get me freedom. We both got the same objective. We just got different ways of getting at it. So I, I, I studied this man, Billy Graham, who preaches white nationalism. That's what he preaches. I say that's what he preaches. Now the whole, the whole church structure in this country is based on white nationalism. 
Now you go inside any white church and that's what you'll see, a uh, white Mary, white Jesus, <laughs> white uh, angels. That's white nationalism. So what Billy Graham does, the way he, uh, the way he circumvents the jealousy and the envy that he would ordinarily incur, cause whenever you go into an area where the church already is, you know you're going to run into trouble because they got that thing, uh, what you call it, uh, syndicated. They got a syndicate just like the racketeers have. I'm going to say what's on my mind because the preachers and the uh, church already proved to you that they got a syndicate. So how Billy Graham gets around that instead of going into an area like he's going to start a new church, he don't try to start a church. He just goes in preaching Christ. And then he says, you go wherever you find him. <laughs> well, this helps all the churches. And since it helps all the churches, they don't find him. Well, we're going to do the same thing. Only our gospel is going to be black nationalism. Now, his gospel is white nationalism. Our gospel is black nationalism. And the gospel of black nationalism is, as I told you, you have to have control of the politics of your community, the economy of your community, and all of the society in which you live should come under your control. Now, once you feel that this philosophy solves your problem, go join any church with that priest. Now, don't go join a church where white nationalism is preached. Because you can go inside of a Negro church and be exposed to white nationalism. Yeah, I mean, if you go inside of a Negro church and you see a, a white Mary and a white Jesus and some white angels, that Negro church is preaching white nationalism. But if you go inside of a church and you see where the pastor of that church is, preaching and practicing that which is designed to bring black people together and lift the black man up. Join that church. Join that church. If you see where the NAACP is preaching and practicing that which is designed to make black nationalism materialize, join the NAACP. Join any organization, civic, religious, political, fraternal, or otherwise, that is sincerely designed on lifting the black man up and making him the master of his community. It'll be the ballot, or it'll be the bullet. It'll be liberty, or it'll be death. And if you're not ready to pay that price, don't use the word freedom in your vocabulary. One more thing, I, I was on a, a program uh, in Illinois with Senator uh, Paul Douglas, so-called liberal, so-called Democrat so-called white man, at, at, at which time he told me that our African brothers and sisters didn't care about us. He said that the Africans don't care anything about the American Negro. I knew he was lying. And in the next couple of weeks, it is my intention and plan to make a trip to our African homeland. And I hope that when I come back, I'll be able to come back and let you know exactly how our African brothers and sisters feel toward us. And I know before I go there that they love us, that we are one, that we are the same, the same man who colonized them all these years, colonized you and me too all these years. So all we have to do is wake up in unity and harmony and the battle will be over. I would like to thank the Freedom Now Party and the Gold uh, Milton and uh, Richard Henry for inviting me here and also Reverend Cleve. And I, I want them to know if there is anything that I could ever do at any time to work with anybody on any kind of program that is sincerely designed to eliminate the political, economic, and social evils that confront all of our people in Detroit and elsewhere. That all you have to do is give me a telephone call and I'll be on the next jet, right on in to the city. La ilaha illaha Muhammadan Rasulullah, peace be unto you. Assalamu alaikum.